Charlie, it's yours. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce um, our next speaker for today, Mason Porter. Uh, Mason, tell us about your living history. All right. So thank you for um, the, for the entire organizing community for inviting me and for people coming to coming to watch both now and um, and later. Um, so let me start with a website. So I, I was told that I'm the the first mathematician who has given a talk in this in this series. So I will attempt to to um, be singular in other ways as well. Um, okay, so what I want to show you here, oh, I have to share my screen. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? Um, there we go, sharing my screen. Um, I'm a very smooth speaker, as you can tell. So my primary thing that I love to do and my primary contribution are my students and my postdocs. And so we are we are wonderfully rigorous about this in mathematics by keeping track of all these things. So this is my PhD students who so far have finished and with several more who are currently in progress, finishing and sending me drafts of thesis chapters, even as we speak. Um, so this is what I really, what really drives me. So let me get into the slides and um, go ahead and get to that as soon as, uh, okay, I will do this one. I was gonna do a different format. All right, so my living history, and then I'm in the Department of Mathematics at UCLA. I actually very recently added a secondary appointment in sociology, so that's a bit unusual. And I also have an external um, professorship at Santa Fe Institute, um, which at the moment means arguing about publication things on a mailing list, but it means other things too. Okay, so um, I'm from LA, so I'm actually working in the west side of LA where I was, where I was born. Um, there are various things that I love. This is a small subset. There's actually a lot more than that. Um, but obviously my friends and my students, and my postdocs, I'm a huge baseball fan, certain types of music, board games, other types of games. I love bright colors and I decided to, for this talk, indulge some of my worst slide production habits because I figured in terms of the purpose of identifying and showing who I am, that this was part of it. Um, as far as a career trajectory goes, so I, I decided to do it on one slide and I, to be honest, didn't even think of including pictures, which is, you know, maybe I should have thought of that. Um, I was an undergrad at Caltech, and then I went to Cornell, and then Georgia Tech, briefly at MSRI, back to Caltech, though in a different department, and then I started a faculty job in math, and then moved to my current job um, at, from Oxford to UCLA in 2016. And one of the interesting things that m one might not, you know, realize in advance is that doing applied math undergrad is a separate department, applied math PhD, separate program, and then mathematics professor is actually very unusual. The two more common ways to become an, uh, somebody who does research in applied mathematics would be to either start as more of a pure mathematician and get more applied, or to start more in the sciences, maybe in physics or maybe in computer science and get more theoretical. It's actually much rarer to just be applied math the whole time. Um, let me try to actually switch slides. Okay, so there are some challenges. Sometimes I'm not gonna dwell on them because I want this to be a positive thing, but they're there. Um, I am an extreme introvert. I don't actually consider that a challenge, but when somebody tries to get me to not be an introvert, that can be challenging. I tend to do things my own way. I have a very strong stubborn streak, um, very strong stubborn streak. And one thing that can be a little bit troublesome for myself is that I can be my own worst enemy and that even very small things can bother me for a much longer period of time than would be ideal. And I have trouble getting over them. And this can be personal things. It can be professional things. Um, there is a good side of this. So it's really a double-edged sword. The details matter. The details really matter. It's not just a matter of getting the big things right. The really precise details matter a very big deal. Um, I have occasionally had to support myself when others were not there for various reasons. I more or less advised my own PhD, which was not the easiest thing. And that also meant that as a postdoc, I had more things to learn that would have been nice to have learned before, but people helped me at that point. Okay, I'm gonna try to move on to more positive slides. Okay, so I'm supposed to be inspirational, um, apparently. Um, so there's a quote, this, this picture is actually on our sixth floor in our math building. I like this quote very much. I forgot who the speaker actually is, so, but I like the quote. The golden age of mathematics, that was not the age of Euclid, it is ours. And 
I mean, it's not just mathematics, but also science, complex systems, and so on. And one of the things behind this, um, and one of the things that it's just, you know, there's lots of things that have been discovered, but there's lots more stuff left. And you're always in a situation where there's lots of stuff left, right? Right now, we have a lot of things related to data science and so on. And they seem to work, except when they don't. But in many cases, we have no idea why. So this is an opportunity, right? There's so much stuff to do. And so it's a golden age. Okay. So I went through that a lot faster than I thought. But anyway, um, so... We're also perhaps encouraged to give some advice, which I will, which I will do. Um, and I want to pass along a piece of advice I actually got independently from two people during during my first postdoc, neither of whom were at that institution, but this was just in discussions. And it's it it, it relates to um, kind of maybe pieces of negative advice, that, uh, pieces of negative comments that one might get from say referees or from other people, where they're like, "Oh, it's it's already solved. It's already well known. People know this." And the thing is, if you a different person looks at a problem a different way, then it's something that can be really different, sometimes really very extremely different. If you actually look at certain old um, papers, so you know, one person I can bring up is, um, is Michael Berry, who's done things with geometric phase and so on. If you actually look at those original papers, he was trying to find some of that work in textbooks. And it turned out that there was deep things that were kind of hidden, but weren't looked at in quite the same way. And so in general, when somebody tells you something is solved, it's like, well, if you change small assumptions, it might be that you get a totally different problem. And different people looking at a problem in different ways are going to lead to very different insights. I and mean, you still have to be careful because you don't want to waste you know, your own time and actually have a career and so on, right? So I'm not trying to be too nuts about this. But there really are a lot of very deep things that you can find by just changing assumptions very slightly. And, and I really don't like the discouragement that people often get of, oh, this problem is solved. You know, people looked at it a different way. And again, the details really matter. Even things that might seem like small assumptions have really very large impacts. So you can tell I'm detail oriented. Maybe I should have said that explicitly before. And also, you know, research is supposed to be fun. So it's great if something is important, but what really matters is that I'm interested in it and that I'm working with um, passionate junior people. So don't focus on what's more important, most important at the expense of your own interest and passion. So people talk so much about impact, which drives me up the wall. Um, and then let me see, this might be the end of the slides, but I'm gonna go back to one other thing from before because I skipped it inadvertently. Okay, well, I'm gonna remind you it's a golden age of mathematics. You can tell that I'm also organized. I am gonna actually go back to another slide if my thing lets me. Um, I want to go back to this slide because I did not mean to skip this. I'm not sure how I managed to do that. So I want to mention some key professional motivations. Okay, so this is a very, I'm a nonlinear person and this is a nonlinear talk. Um, I love to mentor and work with amazing junior people. That's why I showed you uh, my finished PhD students at the beginning. It's why I work very hard. It's why I went out of my way to work so hard that I could hopefully get to a really um, you know, one of these in research intensive institutions, because this would give me the chance to work with amazing junior people. That was really why I myself worked very hard. Um, okay, I already said I don't actually care if things are important. It's nice if some of the research is, but that's not what drives me. Um, I love finding quirky things in daily life. And sometimes that just means normal absurdities. And sometimes that means finding the deep in the seemingly ordinary in terms of research. So I'm not into the, oh, let's go to space and do high energy, whatever. I'm interested in, you know, does a dripping, I didn't haven't worked on dripping faucets, but what is the structure of a dripping faucet? Or if you if you zoom in on stuff, you know, what how how do carpets crinkle or something? Again, not work that I've done, but just the the extraordinary in the seemingly ordinary is something that I, I love. Not not all my work is that way, but some of it is. I love nonlinearity. Um, I love things that when are you have different descriptions of things, like having semi-classics, you have to somehow reconcile two different descriptions and get something sensible. Or in terms of complex systems, if you have many components, I can pick up a grain of sand, but, but sand can also flow. So there's two different descriptions and somehow you have to deal with that, right? So, so those sorts of things, um, both in physics and in mathematics and in their applications. Um, uh, complex systems, finding the simple behavior in high dimensional systems or complicated behavior in low dimensional systems. 
Um, I love math. Unashamedly, I love math. Um, my PhD actually came from, oh, quantum mechanics is really cool and chaos is really cool. What happens when you combine them? It turns out you can combine them and you can even study billiard systems. And I did, I did a lot of, played a lot of pool as an undergrad. So I was really curious about it. Um, and then, yeah, even becoming interested in chaos, I saw nice pictures of fractals and wondered how to make those. So there was an aesthetic interest in where some of my original interests came from. And then I've done a random walkthrough problem space since then. Um, the network science stuff, where that came from. So the, a lot of the a lot of pioneering advances were occurring at Cornell when I was when I was graduating. So a bunch of the small world network and related type things. And especially at the time, but I think it's still pretty true now, there was a low barrier to entry and that you very quickly got to the forefront, even from things that you could explain um, to many undergraduate students. And so there was just a lot of stuff that we didn't understand and don't still understand. And it was something that you could then, you know, take a student who's had a little bit of linear algebra and can code a little bit, and you can already get research papers with them. And so to me, that's a very inspiring type of, of topic to work on, because then I get to work with students already, and I don't have to have to wait many years to, to train them to do to do some esoteric thing. Okay, so I did this in nonlinear order, but I will I will leave it at that. Um, and I right. put this back on so I can see people. Thank you, Mason. I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, so first question we have is, uh, could you share with us the unusual joys and challenges of being an introvert who also enjoys teaching? Um, that's an interesting one. I mean, you know, when you get in the class, you're kind of performing, I suppose. Um, but I I mean, okay, so if you mean teaching in terms of being in the classroom, um, you know, you get comfortable with a group of people, so you can still be introverted and you can lose a lot of energy. And then when you're done, you can, you know, resuscitate your energy. But I think it's being comfortable with the people you're talking to and being in a comfortable environment. Um, so when I'm mentoring one-on-one, -on -one, I'm in a comfortable environment. And when I'm teaching, I am... I am typically in a comfortable environment. I mean, these are, you know, especially, you know, okay, the first day, of course, you're new and you, you talk to students and so on. But, but yeah, it's kind of like you, you, you're, you're performing, I suppose. And then when you're done, you can, you can, um, you can get your energy back by doing something else. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question here. Um, you talked about your, your attention to detail and finding the extraordinary and the seemingly ordinary. Um, you also talked about some people who may consider some problems to have been solved. How do you, you know, how do you communicate that excitement that you have to other people um, over questions that they may not see as extraordinary? Um, okay, I mean, this is in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, if you're talking about my students, I, I would hope that you know they find something they're super interested in, and so we're going to hopefully find a way to get you know, my interests and their interests to mesh together. If you're talking about um, the sort of, you know, referee number three or, or or somebody along those lines, you know, I don't care what they think. I mean, why should I, I mean, why should I care what they think? So, 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 so I don't, so, so I don't know which part you meant in your question, right? But like, you know, when I work with students, their passions are important, not just my passions. And when I'm trying to get something published or, or whatever, you know, I mean, I, you know, I use the good feedback when it's good feedback, but I don't, I don't see why I should try to convince them of anything. Yeah. All right. Cool. I'm sorry, I don't, maybe that's not the answer you wanted, but I, I, you know, I just don't feel I have to please them. Yeah, but no, I think that's, that's a great answer. And we have two more quick questions. So the first one is, um, you know, asking questions with solve solutions that open new vistas of science is intrinsically linked to disturbing strongly maintained status quo in the business of science. So what would be your advice to a younger researcher who stumbled into such a scenario? Who stumbles into such a scenario? Okay, so yeah, so so what 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 is what is the saying? Um, you know, what science advances one death at a time or something? Um, it's not easy. I mean, that's definitely a hard position. I mean, if you have tenure, you just go ahead and do it, right? If you're if you're younger and you're and you're and you're vulnerable, it's helpful to. Um, it's helpful to be working with somebody who maybe is in, in a more, um, I guess, um, privileged position or something to help you out, right? So, so like, um, I mean, normally we have co-authored works, right? So, so if 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 a junior person's doing it and I'm co-authoring with them, then I can kind of directly 
help when it comes to maybe helping with if it's a response letter to a referee if, if in that kind of context um but i would say that for a young person you often are vulnerable enough to rely on the support of somebody who can help you get through it because it really is a very tough challenge and maybe that's not the most positive answer because of course if the young person's right you should listen to them even if they're not yet you know of high status because the fact is that they're right but but you know that's not how the world works so so they might need some support to get them through that yeah all right thank you thank you um yeah and uh, i'm going to uh, pass it to shri for the last question uh, okay. thank you charlie um mason actually the previous question touched upon something i wanted to ask but i want to ask a very variant of that same question which is that uh, so much of what you said you did would could be interpreted as challenging the status quo, at least the way I understand the business of science, um, you know, uh, without going into examples. And um, for a person who is not yet tenured or even early career, um, what are the trade-offs? that you thought through and did you think through maybe this choice means that I won't remain in academia anymore? Um, and did you think about life after academia when you were making these choices? Okay. So, I mean, I wasn't intentionally challenging any status quo. I just like to do things the way I like to do things. There was, there was not like, there was, there was not some active attempt to, to do anything. Um, I mean, I had my frustrations um, when I, um, when I, when I first was on the faculty job market, I tested the market. I had three years at Georgia tech. I tested the market, sent stuff to maybe 10 or 20 schools. I was especially interested in no one expressed any interest. And, you know, there, I, I panicked a bit And the next year I sent stuff to like 200 schools and got, you know, things were a lot better, uh, you know, things were a lot better, but I mean, there was, there was definitely an amount of stress in involved, um, and I was feeling, I started feeling better when I actually started getting interesting schools, you know, contacting me to interview me. And so that was really, so this was now, um, this would be December of 2004, right? You know, so, 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 so once I started getting, getting, getting some positive, you know, vibes, there, I was like, okay, I'm getting interviews at places, something will probably, you know, will probably work out. Um, I did apply to a couple non-academic jobs, and if I really had to, you know, if I, if I really had to, I would have done it. But it's not—it's not something I ever wanted. It was always—it was always a backup, um, you know. So, so thankfully, I mean, like, it, thankfully, I didn't have to. Thankfully, I didn't have to do it. Um, but um, someone like me really works better in academia because I, I can be. I can I can be very single minded and, and and if if I'm in a situation where I have to do what somebody else tells me to do that doesn't tend to work out very well. So it's good that I'm in academia. Uh, thank you. Um, one last word, please. We have a preeminent member of the audience who, I believe, went to the same high school as yours. Uh, so do you want to do a shout out? A preeminent member of the young. So, so I went to Beverly Hills High School. I graduated in 1994. Um, there, there, the so preeminent here. I yes. Um, Pedra, are you here? Yes. You didn't go to my high school. Oh, my bad. Okay, okay. I know him. I know him very well. He didn't go to my high school though, and he's definitely preeminent, no question. Um, <laughs> but, but. Um, yeah, I went to I went to Beverly Hills High School, which is which is which is which is well known and produces people with with a stereotype that's rather different from me. Um, uh, but yeah. All right. Thank you so much for being a sport and taking that last question. Also, many thanks um, for this wonderful talk. Um, 